All right, Gary, it's good to see you again. Oh, it's good to be back. It's an honor. All right. So you know what? Actually, at this conference, um, three times today, four times yesterday, speaking to some of our keynotes on the stage, I'm always asking where they're putting cash. Uh, again and again and again at this year's events, uh, some of our smartest money for 2024 is looking at the royalty and streaming business. Um, I want to get your thoughts on why you think that is, because obviously they're seeing something in the market performance and behavior of these companies that's telling them there's stronger reason than normal to look at royalty and streaming companies. Whenever I meet a new investor who has no exposure to the precious metal sector, and at this conference, by the way, yesterday in the speaker hall when we opened up, the hall was packed. I asked the audience how many people are here for the very first time, and about 35% of the people raised their hand. Uh, maybe it was 30. I'll say 35, raised their hand, here for the first time. And whenever I get asked, how should I begin building a position in the precious metal sector, I point people towards the royalty streaming business because it's such a volatile industry. There's so much you can't control with royalty and streaming companies. You can control a lot more, right? You can, you can remove the risk of too much dilution. You remove the uh, inflating input cost in the business models, all this stuff. And I'm going to be honest, I push them to Wheaton, right? Because you guys are the 800 pound gorilla in this sector. Um, I'm a people over everything kind of investor. I've known Randy, your CEO for many years. Great guy, you and I have shared a stage before. I trust the management. And when you're putting capital in any of these companies, what you're doing is asking somebody else to be a steward of your money, right? And so you wanna make sure you're selecting the right steward. So um, Gary, if we could kick it off just with you introducing the Wheaton business model, let's start right from the top and then I'm gonna pull on some threads. Uh, is there anything left to say? I mean, uh, you did such a good job of, um, of covering, uh, a lot of the, the, the major points. I think, uh, why you're seeing, uh, you know, so much interest in the space is, is, uh, the underlying, uh, tailwinds that I think exist for precious metals in general right now with, uh, the inflationary environment that we're in that I, I really don't see any end to. And, uh, and then you layer on top of that the uh, geopolitical uh, risks uh, that exist out there, and they just seem to be getting uh, broader and, and deeper. So um, that uh, all bodes well for, for the commodity price. Uh, and I, I think what, what sets the streamers apart is what you uh, touched on already, which is you know us insulating the investors from exposure to the escalation of costs uh, in, in producing the metal. And so if you contrast an investment in uh, wheat and precious metals with uh, an investment in your typical precious metal mining company, um, you know, the, the precious metal miner tends to, uh, uh, an increase in commodity price tends to over time result in a uh, dropping of, of cutoff grades, which uh, just increase the cost per uh, ounce of, of production. And so, you actually, over time, uh, don't get the same margin expansion that you do by investing in a streamer where we fix our, our, our costs per ounce uh, and lock those in uh, uh, forever. Can you walk us through some highlights within the Wheaton portfolio? Uh, you guys outperformed in the market 2023. Wasn't a good market for precious metals companies. Wheaton did very well. Um, you also paid a dividend. Um, if you can walk my audience through why you think that is, I'm kind of lobbing you an easy one here, but you know, what's in the portfolio that you like to talk about? Uh, there's lots of things in our portfolio that I like to talk about. I, you know, I think what, uh, why we've done so well, um, over the last couple of years is, uh, because people are really starting to, uh, tune into the fact that we you know, really spend an enormous amount of time uh, up front doing very detailed due diligence on on any of the assets that we invest into. And, uh, you know, I think uh, we're being rewarded now for being uh, such disciplined stewards of, of capital. Currently, we have uh, 35, interest in 35 different mines uh, uh, located in uh, 15 different countries with uh, 25, 26 different counterparties. So we've got a very diversified uh, portfolio of assets. And, and we've been by far over the last uh, three years, the most uh, successful um, 
uh, streamer out there uh, with respect to layering in additional uh, uh, precious metal streams. And and we're also uh, the the most uh, precious metal uh, uh, focused of the streamers. 98% of our production comes from uh, precious metals, which is far in excess of, uh, of what uh, any of the other, any of our other peers have. Um, you know, and I, I, I would uh, say that we, we take a very uh, disciplined approach to the way that we evaluate these, these transactions. And, uh, and, you know, what I think uh, has happened is, you know, over the, you know, we're celebrating our 20th anniversary this, this year. And over those 20 years, we've uh, really established ourselves as a counterparty that the mining companies that, that access our form of capital uh, have come to trust. These, these agreements that we enter into are life of mine agreements. And, uh, you know, you can never anticipate all the permutations and combinations of things that are going to happen over the the life of a, a, a mine and and when things go differently than either party had anticipated we've shown a willingness to modify our agreements in order to uh, ensure that the mining company is happy and so I think that's really helped uh, fuel our growth uh, growth story and so one of the biggest risks with companies uh, in this business is dilution always issuing new shares to raise more cash as I mentioned at the front end of this conversation, one risk you reduce with a streaming company is that you're cash flowing, and so you need to raise cash less frequently, therefore not diluting my position as a shareholder. You said 35 mines run by 25 companies. Um, what does that mean from a cash flow standpoint if gold is sitting where it's sitting today around $2,000? Yeah, I mean, uh, we've put, um, about $10 billion into streams to date uh, over the 20 years that we've been in existence. Um, and uh, we've already generated, uh, recovered more than $10 billion of, of cash flow. Uh, we currently have an average proven and probable life in our portfolio of over 30 years. And if you layer in resources on top of that, we, uh, we, our average life is more than 60 years. And uh, we're currently generating about a billion dollars of operating cash flow annually. We, we dividend out 30% of that to, uh, to shareholders. Um, and we ended Q3 with over $800 million of cash on hand uh, with a $2 billion undrawn revolving credit facility and a $300 million at the market uh, equity program if we ever uh, needed additional capital. So, you know, I, I, we, we are self-funding. We haven't raised issued equity since uh, 2016. And, you know, I, I don't foresee us uh, ever really needing to issue equity again. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we, we have a lot of opportunities in our um, uh, corp dev pipeline right now, and, and hopefully we'll find a home for the, the billion or the $700 million that we're retaining uh, each year. But if we, uh, if we can't, uh, you know, find a good use of proceeds um, uh, for that money that we're generating, you know, we will look at ratcheting up the, the payout ratio on the dividend. Okay, so do you say 300 or 400 billion in the treasury at present as of Q3? Eight, 800. Sorry, 800, 800. Yeah. $2 billion credit facility untouched right now. And it was 400 million in equity you could draw upon. $300 million at the million. market. Okay, yeah. so tons of cash. We'll tons. tons of cash. Tons. Right. So what are you doing right now? Because the, the reason I like talking to you, executives like you is because at a much smaller scale, Gary, we're playing the same game. We're looking for deals out on that show floor, right? You're looking for undervalued uh, opportunities where you can set up streaming agreements, right? That'll pay you in the future, right? Buy future offtake from these mining companies. Given the state of the market right now, so therefore, in theory, there would be a time for you to be aggressive and be hunting, right? When the market's depressed and these companies are having trouble raising cash, you can come in on better terms and lock that up, right? If the market's thriving, then the metal prices go up and you can sit back and get paid, right? So right now, what's the mindset at Wheaton? Are you guys in, in hunting mode? Are you, are you harvesting? Or are you sitting back and waiting? What are you doing? Yeah, we, we are on the hunt. Um, okay. You know, the, uh, I don't, I, I've been with the company for over 15 
years. And uh, I don't know that I've ever seen us uh, as busy as we are right now on the corp dev side of things. Mm. Now, the deal size is much smaller. Uh, we're talking kind of 100 to 300 million dollars of, of upfront payments uh, I individually. But we're we're juggling, you know, ten to fifteen deals at any uh, uh, point in time right now. So, uh, and they're all it's all inbound uh, interest. So we're not knocking on doors right now. And so, uh, yeah, we we have um, we have a lot of on the go. And and you know, I think uh, I'd be very surprised if we didn't announce another few deals. Uh, before the end of this year. And again, you know, we did last year, we did over a billion dollars of uh, new transactions over the last three years, we've done uh, two and a half billion dollars of uh, transactions. And I don't see an end to that really, um, you know, with commodity prices uh, doing what they're doing generally, uh, you're seeing a lot of mines that were uneconomic 10 years ago becoming economic today and uh and we like to as you as you put it uh you know get a get a, a foothold uh in in this environment so a billion dollars a billion dollars in the last year invested could you walk me through a couple of those deals just so we can understand the structure a little bit well the biggest one was the uh the deal that we did with orion where we uh we acquired uh, three uh different mines the biggest one in that was the uh the stream on uh, Platte Reef, um, and uh, so we're taking platinum, palladium, and, and gold from uh, from that asset. That generates about uh, ten thousand gold equivalent ounces of uh, production to our account uh, per year, um, starting uh, this year. Uh, so you know that was you know uh, over half of the. Uh, the billion dollars uh, that we deployed, but we did uh, a deal with uh, Lumina. We did a royalty deal with uh, Liberty. Um, so you know we've been we've been very active, and and you know we still. Uh, so the, the, that was eight new transactions that we did over 2023, but we still say no uh, a lot more than we say yes. You know we're we're not taking our sites off of uh, being very disciplined in, in the way that we approach uh, growth. So what are you looking for then in 2024? What kind of deals are going to get through the door, Gary? Yeah, it's uh, still primarily gold streams, uh, uh, primarily relating to uh, copper assets um, that are uh, in sort of pre-development. So they're looking to raise capital to build these mines. This is exactly what the streaming model was uh, designed for. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're very excited about uh, the opportunity set. And as I think I've conveyed already, we're well positioned from a balance sheet perspective to execute on, uh, on that growth. How much today do you factor in geopolitical concerns? Like more than you used to? Are you flat on that? Are you looking at specific regions? Are you eliminating some altogether from your purview? Yeah, I, I would say that uh, we're not um, any more focused on it now than we, we have been. We've, we've always had political risk as one of the um, main um, uh, categories of risk that we need to get our hands around uh, before we make an investment. I would say that the uh, uh, price of that political risk is rising in uh, in today's environment. And um, walk me through that. What do you mean? Well, you just got uh, you know if you look um, in, in South America right now, you've got a lot of uh, countries kind of leaning more left uh, than they have over the last. Uh, uh, five to ten years now in most of those regions we feel that that's kind of just normal cyclicality of of uh, the swing of uh, uh, of of you know the uh, the social systems down there um, and and expect uh, that it'll move back towards center and then swing a little bit right but um, you know it it, uh, it does seem to be uh, you know a little bit of a heightened uh, risk that we we really need to price into our uh, our our transactions uh, uh, with a with a higher premium these days than uh, than we would have as far as uh, 
countries that are just no goes. You know, there there are but a, a number of them. Russia, China would be two that uh, we would stay away from. There's some uh, areas of Africa that we would uh, be willing to uh, to do streams relative to, um, but uh, there's there's. If, uh, Venezuela obviously would be out of uh, out of bounds, but there's few countries outside of those that we we wouldn't be able to structure something in order to uh, uh, protect our investment um, and uh, and get an appropriate uh, return for our uh, shareholders. And just because Time Horizon has come up on stage today many many times from many investors and just discussing the importance of retail investors being having conviction in their time horizon. Is there a minimum mine life that you need to see to be interested in a new project? That's a good question. Uh, yes. You know, uh, we're, we're looking at getting um, exposure to like long-term exposure to precious metals. And so, uh, you know, if, if you look at like a five year mine life um, that would be nowhere near long enough for us to take the the risk what we don't want to do is do a deal at the top of a market and you know over the next you know your your cycles for precious metals have uh, uh become much shorter uh you know and i i i think uh but you could still catch a downdraft and end up uh losing money whereas if we've got uh 30 years of mine life uh, a little bit of a downdraft, uh, you know, in yeah. the first few years, not going to not going to matter to us. If you look at uh, our our uh, history, we've, as I said, put ten billion dollars to work in the streaming space, and uh, we've generated an average after tax return uh, annualized of uh, over seventeen percent on uh, for the twenty years that we've been in uh, in business. So, you know, I think uh, I think. Uh, we're going to stick to the the model as uh, as you know we've developed it. So I love how you touched on that because it came up a lot. You just mentioned you know if your if your time horizon is is thirty years, it doesn't matter so much if there's a downdraft inside of five years because you've got conviction in your three decade time horizon. You know, this morning on stage we were talking about exactly that concept and how frequently investors will get into a position and watch it you know month over month or week over week and watch the quarterly performance. When if you step back before you make a trade and decide, I'm investing for 2030. And my thesis with this decision is based on that time horizon, 2030. Then in theory, right, it gives you the tenacity to weather the short-term volatility because, you know, that's not, what you're, that's not what you're invested for. And in any secular bull market, there's going to be massive volatility along the way. Nothing goes up in a straight line, right? It goes up and then down up a bit more because... There's long-term value investors like myself, and then there's short-term traders that overbuy and oversell and overbuy and oversell the whole way. Um, okay, so just to recap, you know, I, I, I know I'm just pumping your tires here, Gary, but like, I think it's, it's very important. And I talked about the barbell approach in my workshop yesterday and how if you're going to play in a super high-risk market, that's great, and I do, but what you need to do first is build your anchor points, build the stable side of the barbell out so that you know if everything goes south on the speculative side, you're going to be okay. And for me, that's real estate, that's precious metals, that's cash, and it's companies like Wheaton, right, who constantly outperform the market, but they're cash flowing a billion dollars in free cash flow this year, right? And they, they pay that back to you. It's a cash flowing asset. It's something you buy and you hold and you don't sweat the volatility because it's paying you. And if the share price appreciates, all the better. All right. Gary, thank you. Mic drop on that. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs>